Hi guys, my name's Michelle, I'm from Mint Cakery, and today I'm gonna to show you how to make this chocolate pear and salted caramel cake. So it's like a rich chocolate mud cake, it's got pears baked into it, and then it's got a delicious ganache on top with some salted caramel, and then we're also gonna garnish it with some brandy snap shards and some chocolate shards. So there are a few processes in making everything to bring this cake together, but it is definitely worth it, so you have to give it a go. First off, we're gonna make the cake and get that in the oven to bake. So, we've got three eggs and our caster sugar. And get that on so it's nice and light. So just like a medium speed and it'll whip up. Okay, so while that's whipping up, we're going to put the dry ingredients together. So I'm actually a bit lazy when it comes to sifting things but I always sift cocoa, it always has lumps in it no matter what brand you're using. So, flour in, the cocoa. Always use the best quality cocoa that you can find. So I use the Dutch cocoa. It makes a nice dark cake in the end. It makes such a difference compared to regular cocoa. And then it's just a tiny bit of baking soda. Give that a sift. Don't be lazy, you definitely have to do the sift the cocoa in this part. See all those lumps, that's gonna go in your cake and then you're gonna get a big pocket of dry cocoa in your mouth, so you don't want that. So you can just set that aside. And then I've got my chocolate, I've just melted it in the microwave. And I'm gonna mix it with my oil. Just give it a bit of a stir, it doesn't really matter, we're just gonna put both of these into the mixer together. Do all of your prep while your eggs and sugar are whipping up. So we're gonna get that nice and light and fluffy. So we've got our dries, we've got our chocolate and oil, and I've also chopped my pear. If you have a small pear, use two, so that's what I've done here. And then we're also gonna line the eight inch tin with some baking paper. I don't mess around with this. I literally just put the paper in, get my fingers, and kind of push it to the sides. And then see you have a circle, and that means you can just cut around the circle and it's super easy. I like to also spray the tin with some oil, and I do this as I'm prepping in the beginning, and then I also spray the tin again, just as the cake is gonna go into the tin, and that way you're gonna have no dry bits without the oil, so it will rise nice and evenly. Okay, so our eggs and sugar are nice and light and fluffy, so I'm just going to turn off the mixer. I'm going to pour in the chocolate and the oil. And then just give that a little quick mix. Not too much because it is going to mix again with our dry ingredients. This is actually quite a runny mixture as well. So don't worry thinking like if you've done something wrong because you probably haven't. Then give it another mix. So once it's nearly incorporated, I'm just gonna put all of my milk in and then finish mixing it. So like I said earlier, this is a really runny mixture, but you haven't done anything wrong, it's okay. So I'm gonna spray my tin again. You don't want it sticking, it's really obvious if you haven't greased your tin properly, it will like rise on one side and not the other, so to get a nice flat cake too. So all into your tin, see how runny it is? That is all good, it's what you want. This cake also works really well gluten free, so just replace the plain flour for any gluten free flour you like. And pears on top. So this will take about 60 to 70 minutes to bake. I'm gonna check it at 60, see how it's going. And then it might need another 10 or so minutes, especially if you're using like fridge cold pears, minor room temperature, so it won't cool down the mixture anymore, but just things like that you need to watch. Okay, so time for salted caramel. I like to say you have to get scared twice before your caramel is ready. If you don't kind of panic, then you're probably gonna end up with really light caramel. And so, yeah, we don't want that. We want it nice and amber. So if you're not panicking, I can nearly guarantee you it's not ready. I've got my sugar in the pot. This is a wet caramel, so I'm gonna add some 
water. I'm only gonna stir it so the sugar and the water are combined. And then I'm not gonna touch it again until the sugar is a nice amber color. So we're only gonna swirl the pot. If it does start to caramel around the caramelize around the outside and kind of crystallize, then I'm gonna run a bit of cold water around the edges. So have your element on the highest setting. You want this to be super quick. And while your sugar and water is heating up, you wanna get your cream, your salt, and your butter all ready to go. If you don't measure it first, by the time you get your like scales, weigh your cream, your sugar will probably burn. So you have to be super organized, ready to go. Also, be really careful, this is hot sugar. It burns and sticks to your skin, so yeah, keep an eye out. I'm gonna have a whisk, so the whisk is for when I put the cream and butter in, and then I probably won't need the spatula again, but we'll leave that there. And then also you need a heat proof bowl so we can chill it down. So we're about halfway there. I'm just gonna swirl the pot gently so you can see it has a lot of surface bubbles. So still no touching it. You don't wanna get any utensils in there. And it's kind of just starting to get a little bit of color, but it's gonna go so, so dark before we even touch it. Okay, so I'm gonna give it another swirl. I can start to see it kind of going nice and golden in the center there. And when you swirl it too, you also kind of make it cook and heat up evenly. So I remember when I first started making caramel, I would stop like here and like, don't do that, that sucks. It's so runny as well. You want to get it really nice and dark and it'll also be nice and thick too. So it is kind of scary. It takes a couple of turns to get used to it. You'll also notice that the all the water evaporates, so the steam goes and the you almost like start to see a bit of smoke. Don't be scared. And when it starts to burn your eyes, that's when you know you're getting a bit closer to. So, super golden. And also the surface, you get really tiny bubbles. And that's when you know you're really close. This will go from perfect to burnt in two seconds flat. So, taking it off the heat. Okay, be really careful. A little bit of cream at a time. If this splashes on you, it will hurt so bad, so. I also like to put it into the kitchen sink. And then so if it does splash up, it just goes onto the sink and not on your arms. And now it has stopped kind of splashing really intensely. So then all the cream can go in. Butter and the salt. Again, still be really careful. If you find you get like little clumps of sugar or it's cooled down quite quickly, you can put it on the element just to fully combine it. But I think we're gonna be, oh good. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna finish whisking it. All the butter has incorporated. So now we can just pour it into our heat proof dish. Be super careful too, you make you need to make sure the dish is heat proof or else your bowl will crack. So you don't want that either. And then I'm gonna put this in the fridge so it sets nice and fast. And so that's for the top of our cake. Okay, so I'm gonna make some dark chocolate shards. I'm just making sure my microwave safe jug is completely clean. You don't want any oil or any water because that's gonna not be friends with the chocolate. Put it into the microwave and do 30 second bursts. So I'm definitely not a chocolate expert. I wing it every time and I also get really scared every time that it's not gonna temper. It's like an absolute craft and it still freaks me out. But we are going to melt the chocolate and then we're also gonna add a little bit of like more chocolate of just the budlets that haven't been melted to bring the temperature up and then we're gonna bring it back down to 31 degrees. You can tell I don't really know what I'm doing because I can't even explain it. But if they're not fully tempered, it just means your chocolate shards won't have that really nice snap. But like for the top of the cake, it's all good. It would just be like if you're making like little actual chocolates or Easter eggs or things like that where you need to temper the chocolate. 
Okay, so our chocolate is mostly melted. Just gonna add a bit more of that unmelted chocolate in and then you now you have to keep stirring. Sometimes when I get impatient too, like my bowl is quite hot from being in the microwave, I'm actually gonna change it out. Okay, so I have a bigger bowl. This is just to save time because that's like part of my personality is trying to figure out how to do something quicker. So into a nice cold bowl. I'm gonna keep stirring. I'm gonna check the temperature now as well. See where we're at. And also try stir at the same time because you don't want those crystals to form in your chocolate. You have to be really patient, something I find quite difficult, but we'll get there in the end and it'll be worth it. This is a really good quality chocolate. If you didn't want to do this step, you could just use compound chocolate and you don't need to temper that. So you could literally just melt it, stir it, put it on your baking paper and let it set and you won't have to worry about these issues. And most people really can't even tell the difference between eating compound and Kovacha chocolate, but I can. Okay, nearly there, we're at 34 degrees. So it's nice and shiny too, it's what we want. And then when we put it onto the baking paper, we're gonna spread it out super quick. We don't wanna mess with it too much once we have got it to the correct temperature. You'll also know that your chocolate isn't tempered is if it goes a little bit cloudy. That means the crystals haven't formed properly. You can remelt it and have another go. But again, if this is not your cup of tea, just leave it out. Use compound chocolate, you're all good to go. Okay, so we're there. The nice cold bowl made it super fast. I'm just gonna put it onto the baking paper and spread it out with the palette knife. Go nice and thin, as thin as you can. And again, I'm gonna stop messing with it soon. Okay, I'm done, that's enough. And then I'm just gonna put it on a cooling rack and then it's gonna cool nice and fast too because it's got the airflow underneath. And that should be all set and ready to go when we are there for our decorating our cake. Okay, so onto the ganache. I like to do it in the microwave. You can do it on the stove top if you like, but this is nice and easy. So, your chocolate and your cream into a microwave safe bowl and I'm gonna put that in for one minute. Okay, so it's been a minute in the microwave. I'm gonna get that out and just give it a little stir. and then back into the microwave for another minute. Okay, so it's been in the microwave for two minutes now, and I'm just gonna get my whisk and go straight in. Be quite vigorous. Get that chocolate and cream fully combined. See, it's nice and steamy, that's what you want. If you have a low-powered microwave, then you'd probably need another 30 seconds or so. So if it's not steaming, then you definitely need some more. Nice and shiny. This is actually best made the night before so it can just set overnight on the bench top but if you want to use it the same day like I am I'm just going to chuck it in the fridge and it's going to set up nice and fast so quick and it's so delicious too and you don't really need, really need too much on top of the cake too because it's so rich but it just goes so well with the chocolate cake okay all done easy as Okay, so we're also gonna make some brandy snaps for the top of the cake. So it's in the Christmas section of the book. Once you make your brandy snaps at home, you can never buy supermarket ones again, but we're gonna spread them out flat on a tray. So they're gonna look like this, and then we're gonna snap it up and put it onto the top of the cake. I like them too because they are like quite caramelly, and so they're super crunchy too. So when you're eating the nice, rich cake, you get like a crunch of the brandy snap. People always ask what it is, and they can't figure it out because that's so random to bake kind of brandy snaps. But yeah, so nice and caramelly with the golden syrup and the sugar. 
So we're going to put out butter, golden syrup, and caster sugar into the pot. I like to put the butter, golden syrup in the pot first and then the caster sugar, just so it doesn't catch and burn. And then we're gonna melt that together. I just have my pot on a bit of a medium heat. You don't want to burn your sugar. So we're literally just melting these three ingredients together. And I have some baking trays ready to go, lined with baking paper. And then we're gonna put our flour, ginger, and lemon juice in. So I'm just gonna keep going until that butter has melted. Got a whisk ready to go as well. We're gonna to switch to the whisk when we put the flour in. And then, so we don't want any lumps. You can make these a week or two in advance. They keep really well in an airtight container. And if you are gonna make brandy snaps at Christmas, you can make them in advance as well and just fill them with cream before you go to serve them. They are so, so delicious. Like, you, I actually could never eat a supermarket one again. They are so gross compared to this. And once you've made them a few times, they're super easy. Yes, they are hot though, especially if you're making proper brandy snaps to eat and you need to roll them up. I use gardening gloves, so I don't burn my fingers. But yeah, just takes a bit of practice, as everything does when you're baking. Okay, so, starting to boil a little bit. I'm just gonna keep going until all of that butter is fully melted. But see, I'm scraping the bottom of the pot. I'm covering all the surfaces. I don't want any to catch and burn. Okay, it's all melted through. So now we can add the flour, ginger, and lemon juice. I'm gonna switch out the spatula and I'm gonna to go to the whisk now. Flour, ginger, just give that a quick whisk first. Be nice and fast. If you go too slow, you'll get some lumps too, so. Once that's pretty much incorporated, go in with your lemon juice. It doesn't taste like lemon, so don't worry about that, but it needs the acidity in the mixture and then you're all good to spread it out. So no lumps. If you do get lumps, it's probably because you haven't heated it enough on the stove top and you, you can't really get them out. I would just bake it as normal and then if you get any lumps, you're just gonna have to like crack those bits of dry flour out. I like to use two or three baking trays because they spread a lot. Get a palette knife. This is literally only a third of the mixture and spread it super thin. It's probably going to grow in size about one and a half times. So you don't want to go too far to the edges. And also I just do whatever shape it's going to go in. You don't have to worry about it because we're snapping it up. So that's going to go into the oven now. I'm going to check it at around six or seven minutes and I want it super, super golden. So now we have made all of our elements for the cake. We're going to decorate it now, the best part. So I've got my ganache here, it's all set. I actually sped that up and put it in the fridge so it was ready to go. And I have broken up my brandy snap pieces so they're nice and golden. If you've got a dehydrator at home, it's best to dry out the pears. They will go brown, so you could put them on the cake just before you serve it. Or a little squeeze of lemon juice would stop them from oxidizing, but you don't really want your pears to taste like lemons. So yeah, if you've got a dehydrator, they are pretty cheap from you know, like hardware stores and things. So it's definitely a good investment if you love baking. So I've just got a cake board. I don't want my cake to slip anywhere. So I'm going to just put a little bit of ganache down on the bottom. And I'm gonna flip my cake out. Make sure my baking paper is stuck in the tin, but make sure you peel it off if you have it on the bottom of your cake. Flip it back over. So I just have the stainless steel turntable. It makes it easier for decorating. If you didn't have that, you could just put it straight onto your serving plate. Just gonna give the ganache a little bit of a mix, just because I did speed it up by putting it in the fridge. So we're just gonna bring it back together. If you left this at room temperature overnight, you wouldn't need to do this. 
Just gonna pour some onto the top of the cake and use my palette knife and spread it right to the edges. So I don't like to put my palette knife too close to the edge of the cake. I work about an inch away from the cake and then push it to the edge from there. And then you kind of get a nice clean edge too. So looks quite nice. So this is some of our salted caramel. See how golden and delicious it is. We're gonna drizzle some of that over the top. I like to serve this on the side as well because more is more, so can't get enough of it. And then we're going to snap up our chocolate shards. So place your chocolate shards around the outside of the cake. Put as much on as you can. You want to fill the wreath around the top of the cake. And then I'm going to get the brandy snaps and fill in all those gaps too. So I like to kind of start with a little bit and then go back, add more chocolate, add more brandy snaps. So then once I've put the brandy snaps on, I'm gonna also put the pear slices in. This cake also works really well as a base flavor for like any chocolate cake you wanna make. So if you wanna do this with raspberries instead, that'd be delicious. Keep it a plain chocolate cake. It's really good for stacking and layering two layer cakes too, if you're into that. So it's super versatile. Obviously just leave out the pear and change up your decorations depending on the flavor you wanna make. But it's such a one that everyone loves it. So, I've put my pear on. I'm filling it up quite a lot, as much as I can. Might go in with a bit more brandy snap. And I think I'm pretty good with the shards. I'll just put a few more little ones in. And then of course I can't stop there. I have to put some sort of flowers or mint on every cake I make. So I'm gonna put some mint on this one. And I like to use uneven numbers with any flowers or mint or anything or else it looks weird. So I think I'm gonna do five again. Cool. So that's it all done. It lasts a couple of days at room temperature and in the fridge for kind of three to four days. It's actually nicer the next day because it's like a chocolate mud cake. You have to make this at home, everyone will love it. Yeah, so if you wanna try more recipes like this in my book, then there's heaps more cakes and so you can get creative and make some yum stuff.